Hey there, so how do we get people integrated into our labs, especially people that are from uh, an international background? If that's interesting to you, this video will provide some answers. So it all starts with the understanding and of course while it is super exciting to be in a new place and to start a new project like a PhD in a new city or a new country, um, that's super cool. You have to also realize that it can be quite difficult for people that come especially from different countries into your lab and they will have to deal with a different culture, a different language and different ways things are being done in general in, in your lab and in general. And also you have to keep in mind that these people are just basically then leaving their normal circle of friends and family. So this can be some pretty hard times and I think that that's why it's so important to focus on how we can best integrate these people. And it's just some of the things that we do. So one thing that's super important in my opinion is to have these lab routines. So we have some of them and those lab meetings that we have twice a week. I made some videos about them and I'll link to them in the description. But they're, they're, they're very good also for people that come in for two different reasons because when the incoming people attend them then over the course of several weeks they will have seen a lot of people giving presentations so then they know what they are working on and what projects they currently do so they become more naturally familiar with what goes on in the lab but also it's a venue for these new incoming people to give presentations themselves so usually after they've gotten some time to adjust we invite people to just introduce themselves to the lab uh, say where they're from uh, what they've done in their previous degree and what they're planning on doing here and this way everybody else will get to know what the new people are all about and they can already start conversations with them in terms of how can we collaborate, how can we help you and so on and so forth and that is a super useful thing to have and so I think that is definitely one of the most important points to have these lab routines that are very regular meeting points. What's also important is to have a lab communication tool, um, in our case we use the free version of Slack. Um, that really is tremendously better than email because it is essentially a no threshold way of communicating. So if you, uh, you can announce things very easily, you have channels so people that have common interests will naturally sort of congregate in these different channels and have little chats. But people that have just basically no threshold to uh, send messages to each other, I think we have about 10,000 messages sent a month among lab members, mostly messages among individual people but also messages to channels and I think having this super low threshold communication tool is just super important for this integration. I think it's also good to have regular check-ins during the pandemic anyway I don't bump into people as, as regular anymore so I decided to have um, sort of weekly reports from people they're just ways for people to, to check in and they don't have to be elaborate reports some people just write two or three lines of bullet points or and there's no big deal if nothing particular happened on that, that was um, that is worth talking about it, it, it's normal that this happens so just right now I just kept you know weighing samples or something but that way you just have a regular check-in so if reports are not coming then you know something must be afoot and so you can you can basically act. So I think it's good to have these regular check-in or in-person meetings or you know you can meet for a, a coffee or in our case go walk in the garden or something but just some regular way of checking in on people. It's also really important to integrate new people into existing subgroups so especially in, in big labs. So we're a fairly big lab and it can be overwhelming and maybe a bit anonymous because there's just so many people that's very hard to keep track of in the beginning. So therefore it's super important that you are part of a little subgroup for example when you come into the lab. So maybe you are in the microplastic group or you are in the soil aggregation group or whatever or in the plant group. That way you immediately have a little circle of people to talk to and uh, this is again facilitated by the, our communication tool like Slack because we have channels uh, for all the different topics. People can make up channels as they want and then they will be able to communicate fairly effortlessly with their own kind so to speak and I think that that is just super useful. And what we have actually done in order to make that more efficient and more multi-dimensional because people have like a bunch of different interests uh, we started having a little um, just uh, online Google Sheet where we 
have names and then we have the expertise and the interests of people listed in as many dimensions as we like. And so when people come in, they can very easily query this Google Sheet basically and say like, oh, who else is interested in microplastic and working with fungi and is good with R? So they can basically immediately identify that a subgroup of people and then know who then to talk to. It, it, it is a, just a way of having a, an opportunity to identify with more than one topic, right, very effortlessly and also to figure out if somebody is very similar to you. But I think we've also thought about, I haven't really done that yet, but to identify people that are just on the exact opposite of ends, <laughs> because they may have the most interesting conversation where they bring new stuff to the table for both of them involved, right? So this might also be a way to use it that we haven't really explored yet. Um, and so we are still new with testing this uh, Google Sheet. Maybe I'll talk about it in some other video later on when we have more experience with it. But I think this is also a good idea to just have people have communicated to people very clearly who does what in the lab. And as I said, it's a bit difficult to do when the lab is relatively large. Something that may be a very good idea that we haven't really formally done in terms of having it sort of semi-institutionalized is to have this buddy system. So when somebody comes in, they immediately paired up with one person, maybe just for a period of time that um, you know is sort of taking care of them and in a, in a sense of like you know telling them where the good bakeries are or where you can find the pipette tips or who to ask what and how things work in the lab um, at the university as well. So we haven't really done that formally. It seems like this somehow happens most of the time anyway. So people just sort of um, attach themselves to somebody and then get sort of a, a better start this way. But, you know, maybe we could be better in terms of uh, having this more formal that, you know, when you come in, you get basically assigned a buddy for a period of time. And then we make sure that everybody has that buddy because currently we're not really checking out if this really happens. Right, so these are a whole bunch of ideas and um, how we try to integrate people in the best way possible. Sometimes it works better, sometimes it works not as perfectly as things are. And uh, well, if you have any ideas on how to integrate people effortlessly in the lab, sort of this onboarding, as it's called more in the professional world, please let me know in the comments and uh, because we also like to be always better at things. And thanks for watching and see you in the next video.